We're going to talk about Atwood's machine here. And uh, it's worth knowing the name Atwood's machine, why it's, it's, it's named for an early experiment that actually has some interesting historical significance that we're not going to talk about right now. Um, but basically, anytime you see two masses connected by a string that runs over a pulley, that setup is often referred to as Atwood's machine. There are a bunch of variations on it, but this is the canonical Atwood's machine. So let's just think for a moment about what would happen if we released this system. We've got, uh, we've got a six kilogram block here, and we've got a four kilogram block here. And if we let go, presumably the six kilogram block is going to descend and the four kilogram block is going to go up. And that's makes good sense intuitively, right? The heavy thing is going to go down and the light thing is going to go up. Before we talk about how to work with this using physics, it's really important for me to just do a quick little misconception alert. It would be really tempting based on our intuition to be like, oh, the six kilogram thing is going down because it's heavy and the four kilogram thing is going up because it's lighter, is to think, well, what is pulling up on the four kilogram thing? Well, what must be pulling up on it would be the, you know, the, the six kilogram thing. That's what's pulling up on the four kilogram thing. The six kilogram thing is pulling on it. So it'd be really tempting to be like, oh, well, how much is gravity pulling on this? And that's how much is pulling up on the four kilogram thing. That is not true. It's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a mistake that's really easy to fall into. And it's just very important to see up front that that's not the case. One of the ways of thinking about the idea that it's not the case is that if that were true, there are some other things that would have to be true that don't make sense. For instance, if what's pulling up on the four kilogram block is the weight of the six kilogram block, so let's, this is six G. Well, that would mean on the other on the other side, like what's pulling up on the six kilogram block? Well, that would be that would be four g, and what that would mean is that we have this string here, and there are different tensions at both ends of the string. But that is not how strings work. I mean, the way that strings work is that if you have a string and you know you put a hook on it and you pull in this direction with some force, that if we have another thing here. That, that this thing will read the same force as that thing. Strings have the same tension on either end of it as long as they are ideal. And I'm just going to make a quick note here about an ideal string. When we have an ideal string, we mean the following. So an ideal chord. And sometimes you'll see uh, a problem will say, a light chord, which is kind of code for an ideal chord. An ideal chord has zero mass. So its mass is not important. Uh, obviously, strings don't have zero mass. Um, they might have negligible mass. They might have mass that is tiny compared to everything else. And so we assume that they're ideal. And the other thing that's really important about the string is it's inextensible. And inextensible means that it does not stretch. So if it doesn't stretch, the thing that happens because of that is that when the six kilogram block goes down one centimeter, the four kilogram block is going to go up one centimeter. And those two things are going to happen exactly in tandem. Because they're going to go the same distance in the same time, those two objects are going to have the same speed and the same acceleration, obviously the accelerations will have opposite directions, but um, that's a crucial thing. So if you have an ideal chord, then two things are true. Thing number one is the tension is the same at both ends. And the other thing that's true is that both ends have same, uh, I'm gonna, I was gonna say acceleration, I'm gonna say they have the same magnitude of the same, say the same magnitude of acceleration, okay? So they're both accelerating at the same, at the same rate. Okay, so how do we deal with this if we're not gonna make the wrong assumption that I have pointed out here? Well, we're gonna use our classic method that works for every 
basically any single Newton's law problem imaginable. These five steps. We draw a free body diagram. We're going to assign axes. We're going to write Newton's second law for each object in each axis. We're going to apply constraints, and then we're going to solve. So how does that work here? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to draw some free body diagrams. I've got two objects. I'm going to need two free body diagrams. So I'm going to take my four block, and I'm just going to write four in it. And what's pulling down on it? Well, what's pulling down on it is the force of gravity. And uh, I'm just going to make a note here because I know what the force of gravity is. It's going to be 4 times g. And I'm just going to write that down here as 4g. So that's a, that's a strength in Newtons, 4 times g. Um, pulling up, we have the string. We don't know how much the string pulls up, but it's going to pull up with some amount. We're just going to call that t. Um, you could call it you know, f sub t, the force of tension. Um, I'm kind of in the habit of just writing capital T, um, but you do you. Um, on the other side, we're going to have the we're going to have the six kilogram mass. Gravity is going to pull down here with six times the acceleration of gravity. This is the force of gravity or the weight of the six kilogram block. And what's going to pull up on this is also going to be the string, which is going to be some tension that we do not know. But those are the only forces we have for these two objects. All right, check. Free body diagram for each object. We've done that. Next thing we're going to do is assign axes. Now, there are a couple of ways of handling this. I'm going to show you how I do it. Um, you can do it in, in other ways. This is one way. I want to make my life easy because I don't know the acceleration yet of these things, but one thing I know is that they have the same magnitude. And to make my life easy, I'd kind of like it if they also had the same direction. Now, both of these objects are just going to move up and down, right? So I don't need to have an x and y axis. I just have to decide what's positive and what's negative. And what I'm going to do that's a little sneaky here is for the left-hand object, I'm going to say that positive is up because I know it's going to accelerate in that direction. And for the right-hand object, I'm going to say that positive is down. And as long as all of my calculations agree with that sign convention, that's an okay thing to do. And I'm picking that sign convention because that way I can say that both things have the, not just the same magnitude of the acceleration, but they're also going to have the same acceleration. We don't have to go like, well, one is positive A and the other is negative A and get all confused. So this is my sort of looking ahead, sneaky move. All right, so I have assigned axes. Next thing I'm going to do is write Newton's second law for each object in each axis. Now, I'm going to do something that is totally unnecessary here, and I am doing it because you are going to do other problems in which it is necessary. I'm going to do the following. I'm going to make myself a little grid for my Newton's second law statements. And I'm going to be like, oh, on the left, I'm going to have my statement for the four kilogram block. On the right, I'm going to have my statement for the six kilogram block. But I'm going to do this. I'm going to do, I'm going to go X and Y. Now, these, this is a one dimensional problem, so it doesn't matter. But I'm going to do this because when you have problems that are not one-dimensional, you really want to make sure that you've made each of these statements. So, uh, and I'm going to say, well, there's nothing going on in X here, so I'm just not going to make that statement. I'm not going to make that statement. So what's going on in Y? So I've got a positive, so I'm going to, and let's, here's my Newton's second law, right? I could write I can write net force over mass is equal to acceleration. I can write net force is mass times acceleration. Um, honestly, either one is okay because they both mean the same thing. So I'm going to say for the four kilogram block, I'm going to say, what is the net force? Well, I've got a pot, I've got tension pulling up. So I've got tension and then countering the tension, I've got that weight force. So that's minus four G. Um, Notice, by the way, that I have not grabbed my calculator and said, oh, what is 4 times 9.8? Or maybe I want to use 10. What's 4 times 10? I could just write 40. I'm just leaving it as G. And I hope later on you'll see why I've done that. Um, 
it makes the notation a little simpler, um, and it saves using the calculator until later. All right, t minus 4g, and that is equal to the mass over here, which is 4, times the acceleration we don't know. What's our Newton's second law statement for the, the 6 kilogram block? Well, let's see, what's in the positive direction? In the positive direction, we have the weight, and in the negative direction, we have the tension. So I'm going to say the positive force is 6g, and I'm going to subtract the force that's in the negative direction, that's t, and I'm going to say that is equal to 6, that's the mass, times the acceleration. Now, all right, I've done, I've done that. I've written Newton's second law for each object in each axis. Okay, apply constraints is our next step. Interestingly enough, in this case, I have actually snuck the constraints in already. Like what I have said is I've said, oh, hey, this tension here and this tension here, those are the same thing. I could have written this with like, oh, gee, I don't know what these tensions are, and been like, this one is tension number one, and this one is tension number two. And then in my constraints, I could be like, oh, hey, by the way, you know, T1 equals T2. Oh, now we have three equations. I've kind of snuck the constraint in there. Also the same thing for the acceleration. I'm saying that the acceleration of one is the same as the acceleration of the other. I could have written this down as like, oh, you know, here's the acceleration of the four kilogram block, and this is the acceleration of the six kilogram block, and later I'd say, by the way, they're equal. I've just kind of snuck that in here, right? I've just been like, it's acceleration. I know it's gonna be the same on both sides. So I have actually already put in the constraints. When would you need to apply constraints? Well, for instance, let's say there were friction, right? If there were friction involved in this problem, I might want to say like, oh, by the way, there's some friction, right? And I know that that friction is going to be equal to mu times the normal force, right? And then later I'd be like, how can I find the normal force? And what do I know from you? We'd plug some things in. In this case, we don't need that, right? But this, that's what the apply constraints step is four. And in this case, I've already snuck it in. So that means I've done, oops, that means I have applied my constraints and I'm ready to solve. Okay, so let's, let's, let's solve this thing. Um, notice what we have here. We have two equations with two unknowns, right? I don't know the acceleration. It appears here and here right? And I don't know the tension, and it appears here and here. So I can't just right away be like, oh, here's the tension, let's go, or hey, here's the acceleration, let's go. But, you know, I hope you know from math class that if you have two equations with two unknowns, there are lots of ways of using that and beating it up with some algebra and saying, oh, I'll figure out what what is the solution for T and A that will satisfy both of these equations. Um, some people like doing, you know, addition, stacking them up and adding them. I am actually, you know what, the way this is written here, kind of, it's tempting to do that. I often jump for substitution, but I'm just going to write those two equations down again here. And I think you'll notice something. Uh, and again, you know, you set this up your way. At this point, your job is to apply the math you know and be like, I have two physics equations. I'm going to beat it up with some math. But um, if I go t minus 4g equals 4a, and then I go, and now I go uh, 6g minus t equals 6a, and I can then add these two things up, and that's going to make the t disappear, which is kind of what I want, right? I want something where one of my variables goes away, so I can add this up, and t plus negative t is nothing, and then we've got uh, negative 4g plus 6g, let's see, so 6g minus 4g, that's 2g, and that's going to equal, I'm going to add up on the other side, 4a plus 6a, oh, that's 10a. Oh, well, now I know what a is. I can say that a is 2 times g over 10. And now I'm ready to just grab my calculator and calculate out what is two-tenths of G. If you're a person who likes to call G 10, well, the answer is easy. The acceleration is two meters per second squared. If you like 9.8, it's time to grab your calculator. Um, but I think at this point, you can, you can do the math here. And so once you know that acceleration, 
you can then plug that back into one of those things and find the tension, okay? So that is a basic approach to Atwood's machine. Um, and if you're going to solve problems right now, you can just you can just quit watching this and and go on. Um, but I want to I'm, I'm going to add here. I'm going to point something out. Um, and I, 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 in some ways, I'm going to be rude because what I'm going to show you is a shortcut, and then I'm going to tell you, hey, don't use this shortcut. But I'm going to show you the shortcut anyway because I think it is. Um, well, sometimes it's useful. Although again, I think practicing doing this the long way is important. Here's what I want you to notice. Um, I'm going to redraw the problem. So I've got four and six. And wow, that's a terrible drawing. So here's four, here's six. Suppose this were just one big mass, like one big floppy mass. Right? It's this big floppy mass. And so we're going to think about this as big floppy mass. And let's think about what is going on with this big floppy mass. Well, um, on, 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 on this side, gravity is pulling down with 6G. And on this side, gravity is pulling down with 4G. Um, so, but, you know, this side is trying to go, this side is getting pulled up against 4G. This side is getting pulled down with 6G. So, like, the net effect is that gravity is going this way, right, over the pulley to the right. Um, so I'm going to write this out. The net force divided by the mass is equal to the acceleration. So if we, in this, you know, big floppy mass regime, we're like, well, what's the net force? It's over the pulley to the right with 6G minus 4G, otherwise known as 2G. And what's the mass? Well, the mass is the total mass. That's four plus six, that's 10, equals A. Oh my goodness. That's what we got up here. What is happening here? What's going on is that up on the top, we have the difference in the weights, right? We've got the weight of the six minus the weight of the four. And then down here, we've got the sum of the masses. And if we go back up, by the way, if you go back up and you set this thing up and you're like, what if you don't even know the masses? What if they're just M1 and M2? If you go and you sit down and you do out the math, and I'm not gonna take the time to do it here, you absolutely, not only can you do it, but it's a worthwhile thing doing. So being like, oh, this is M1, and this thing here is M2, and this force down here is M2G, and this force down here is M1G, and this force up is tension, and this force up is tension. If you do out all the algebra for this, what you're going to end up with is this. You get A is M1 minus M, or uh, maybe it's M2 minus M1 times G, if we're assuming that M2 is bigger, uh, over M1 plus M2. If you do out the algebra, that's what you get. And really, I encourage you to go and, and do this problem out because it's, it's good practice and it's actually useful in other contexts to have gone through that process. But notice what we have up here is we have on the top, oops, that's not what I meant. Notice what we have here is on the top, we've got the difference in the weights, right? One mass minus the other mass times gravity. And down here we have the sum of the masses. Um, so that's just an interesting thing to notice. Now, gee, shortcut, does that mean you should never do an Atwood's machine problem out? You should just plug this in. And what I would say is, listen, if you're in a rush and you're like, oh my goodness, somebody's got, you know, is going to hit me with a water balloon if I don't hit this, solve this Atwood's machine problem in, in, in two minutes, um, yeah, do it. But the purpose of doing Atwood's machine problems is actually not to do Atwood's machine problems. The purpose of doing Atwood's machine problems really is practicing this process of 
drawing free body diagrams, making two statements that are related, but that you can't solve independently, and then solving them simultaneously. Um, Atwood's machine is, you know, really common in physics classes, not because it has really important physical significance, but because it's really good practice for that problem. The other reason to be really careful about the shortcut, and the other reason why I really encourage you not to use the shortcut, is that you will see other situations that look kind of like Atwood's machine, but where the shortcut won't work. So like if you have this situation and maybe there's even some friction in here, right? That approach that I just said won't work. And it's, you know, there are ways of tricking the shortcut and getting the shortcut to work, but it is much, much better to learn how to do the physics properly than it is to learn how to fiddle with the shortcuts because it's really easy to look at a situation and think, oh, the shortcut will work here when actually it won't. If you haven't learned the basis for the shortcut, it's really hard to know the difference between a situation when, when the shortcut will work and when it won't work. So here's another, like we could have, what if you have a mass here and it goes up to a pulley and then it goes over and maybe we have like a table here and there's a mass sliding on the table. And then there's another string that goes over here and hangs down and this is mass three and you know, this is mass two. And you know, well, the shortcut really won't work for that. But the approach that I laid out above of draw a free body diagram for each of these things, write Newton's second law for each thing, remembering that like the tension throughout this chord is going to be all the same, but not necessarily the same as the tension throughout this chord, but anything like the amount of tension that's pulling over here, like if that's T2, that's going to be the same as the tension here. That's going to be T2. Um, so the approach is the thing that is important. Okay, I hope this helps you go out and solve Atwood's machine problems.